In this video, we're gonna adjust our input response to actually display back to the user what they inputted. So if I type hello, you'll see that hello is inputted and shown back to the user. And then what we're also gonna do is adjust our scroll bar so that if I continue to type things, we're always gonna scroll to the bottom, which is gonna be a nice usability feature while still letting you scroll back up and see the history of what you've typed. But every time you type something new, right back to the bottom. Let's get started. All right, so in the last video, we started sending responses back to the user when they type something, but these responses are really generic and don't really reflect what was typed in. And so what we need to do in this video is actually make it so that we can adjust what is getting sent back to the user based on what they type, or at least get that started if not fully complete. So the first thing we wanna do is take a look at this input response scene that we made. So it's really nice, we're able to continually reuse it, which has been great, but the problem is we don't really have much control over what it's outputting. And in order to adjust this, we're gonna add a script to our input response scene here. So I'm gonna select input response, and one thing, make sure that you are, if you have an input response variable here in uh, another scene, for example, an instance of it, um, make sure you're doing this in the base scene itself. So if we wanna add a script to input response and I do it in our game scene or on an instance, if I add a script here, you'll notice that I've added this script to the instance of input response, but if I go to the scene itself, it does not have a script. So you wanna make sure when you add a script to something, you're doing it on the base scene itself, in the scene file. So what I'm gonna do is get rid of this one here, this uh, instance, and then in input response, in the actual scene itself, I'm gonna add a script you'll see it's actually telling us to load because we just created the script. So this is perfect. And now whenever we instance our input response scene, all those instances will have the same script, which is exactly what we want. So in this script, we wanna provide ways for us from code to adjust both the input that the user was gave and the response that the game is giving back to the user. So in order to do that, we need to get references to both of our input history and response. Now, we could do on ready var, like we saw in the previous one. So I could say on ready var response, for example, and set it equal to response. And this is fine, but with these input responses, we are only gonna need to set them once. When we create them, we're gonna set their values and then never care about them again. And so if we do on ready var here, we're gonna be saving these response and input history variables in memory for the entirety of the existence of this input response, even though we're never gonna set them again. So it kind of makes more sense in this case for us to not store them as variables, but to only access them on the fly as needed. The downside is that when you use this dollar sign, when you try to access nodes in the tree, it's somewhat slow, but in our case, it's not gonna be any issue at all because we're doing it rarely and it's not slow enough that you'll actually notice it unless you're doing it many, many, many times repeatedly. So it's worth it for us to save on memory a little bit and do something that's slightly slower. So what we're gonna do is have a function and we'll say function set text. And here we're gonna say input as a parameter and we're gonna type this as a string. So we're using static types here. Again, if you're not familiar with static types in GDScript, I've got a video on my channel going over everything you need to know about static types, so I would definitely recommend watching that. So we're gonna have an input here that's gonna be a string, and this is just gonna be a way for us to pass in what the user inputted, and we're gonna have a response, which is also gonna be a string. No return type. And here what we're gonna do is say input history dot text equals input. Now, this is gonna be good, um, except when we do this, we're gonna overwrite this caret here. So what we really wanna do is actually say quotation mark and we'll do space, caret, space, just like we have there. And then we'll do the plus sign and then input. And what we're doing here is we're taking two strings, the input string we're passing in and this hard-coded string we're adding to every time we set the text and we are concatenating them. Concatenation is the word when you add or combine strings. So we're gonna concatenate both of these strings together. So whenever we set our input history text, we're always gonna prefix it with this caret, which is what we want to make it match what we've got out here right now. So now that we've got that, we're good to start doing that with our response. So we're gonna say response, and we're just gonna set this to be response because it's already a string, we don't need to know anything there. And be aware and make sure you're not just saying response equals response, but actually response.text. And this is actually setting the text property on that label. 
So if I select this response property out, or this response scene, you'll notice that the property we're actually setting is this text property. If you mouse over, you see the property is just text. So again, we're not accessing the response label itself, but we're accessing and changing the text property on the response label. So that's why we're adding this dot text and not just saying response equals response. So now we've got a function where we're able to give the input and a response to our input response scene and see that in our game. So now what we can do in our game is when we add this input response child, or actually before we do it, we can say input response and we can call that function that we just set, which is set text. And you'll notice that Godot is able to auto-complete that function for us because when you use preload, it is able to pull the script data from this, um, because this is a static file, it's not changing, we're preloading it. We're able to actually pull information from that script. And so it knows that this set text function exists on that script now, and we can pass in our input. And so our input is getting passed into this function here on our game as new text. So we'll say new text. And then remember, we also require a response parameter. We don't have responses right now, so we'll just hard code something for show. This is where a response would go. And now, and we'll change this later, but now if I start our game and start typing something and I type hello, you'll see that it's actually printing out whatever we typed. What? So cool. This is amazing. Please subscribe oops subliminal marketing in there please excuse me but so anyway you see that um we've got some output actually like we're actually responding to what the user types this is really cool it's so easy now and we've actually got something that's kind of responding to our game it'd be a lot cooler if our response actually matched but we'll get there in a second one other thing is that it'd be a little bit nicer if we kind of had some separation between blocks here. So we do want this, the, the input and the response to be close together, but if there's a little bit more space in between here, that would be nice. So we can set that right now. And the way I'm gonna do that is come back to our scene and I'm gonna hit our history rows here. And what I'm gonna do is come to our custom constants and change our separation to be about 20. And what this is going to do is it's going to set a bit of separation between each of our input response children we give to it. Remember, it's not going to change the space between these two because this is controlled within the separation of our input response itself, but it will set the separation between the instances of each input response. What we can actually do here is manually set the separation to zero to make sure it's close together. Can you, can you do negative? <laughs> so you can also do negative. We can make it super close together, but uh, that's not looking very good. But we will keep it set at zero just to make sure there's, these are, it's, it's very clear that this input and this response are tied together. So now if we run our game, I hit command B and I type something, we'll see that our input and our response are close together. But if I type something else, there's a bit of a space between them. So it just is a little bit more clear now which input and which response go with each other it's easier for the user to identify. They don't have to keep track of it or get confused about it. So just a small change that adds a little bit of readability to our game. Okay, so one other change that would be nice to make is that when we start typing a lot and we get down, we can't really see the new things we're typing because our scroll bar is getting stuck at the top. And if we scroll to the bottom and keep doing stuff, it doesn't really help. So if we had a way to automatically bring our scroll bar to the bottom when we type something new, that would be kind of nice. And Godot actually provides a way for us to do that. So we're gonna do it right now. So if we come to our scroll container, you'll see that there are a number of properties here or, or signals here, but they're not really super helpful. But if I add a scroll bar to our game, a V scroll bar, and we're not gonna keep it here, but just for the purpose of demonstration, you'll see that there's a changed property here. And this changed property is, or this signal is emitted whenever the maximum or minimum value of the scroll bar changes or the page or the step, which is how many pages it's at or how much each step of scrolling does. It does not get emitted when the value of the scroll bar, so where the scroll bar actually is a change, which is good because we don't want that, but it does get emitted when the scroll bar's minimum or maximum scroll amount changes. So 
we, we'll get rid of this for now, but the reason I wanted to show that is because a scroll container creates a V scroll bar and an H scroll bar under the hood. We're not using the horizontal one because we've gotten rid of it, but we do have the vertical or the V scroll bar underneath. So if we want to have our scroll container automatically scroll to the bottom every time something new is typed, we can do that by connecting and using the, uh, the changed signal that we saw on the V scroll bar. So first, we need to get access to our scroll container. I'm gonna just call this um, scroll. I'm gonna rename our scroll container so our path isn't as long. And I'm gonna say on ready var scroll. And I'm just gonna start typing scroll after the dollar sign and it should fill in for me. And so now we've got our scroll container. But we need to get the vertical scroll bar that our scroll container has. And so what I can say is on ready var scroll bar and set this to be scroll and you'll see there's a get v scroll bar function built into a scroll container. And so when we call this, it's gonna return the v scroll bar that we can use to get our v scroll bar and, and, and connect to our change property. So now in our ready function, which I'm gonna add, we can say scroll bar dot connect. And you'll see it automatically fills a list of signals on our scroll bar. And we see this change signal that we saw before in the editor. And so I'm gonna connect the change signal and you'll see it wants you to connect, or it, the parameters for connect are the signal to connect to, which object to connect that signal to, and then which method or function on that object to call. So we want, our, we want to connect to our scroll bars change signal. And then the object we want to connect that signal to is our game, which we can reference in our code by writing self. This is similar to Python or Java or other um, object-oriented languages. So this is saying connect our scroll bars changed signal to this script, to whatever script this is, which is our game. And then we have to give it a function on our game script to use. And so we're gonna say function handle scroll bar changed and remember if we looked at when we looked at the changed uh, signal there were no parameters so we won't have any parameters here and right now we'll just do pass which is just a placeholder to say ignore this for now and so we're gonna need to take this name and give it in our connect as a parameter here and so it tries to fill in some um, and we can should be able to find uh, it'll be faster if I just paste it in so remember, the method is a string here. Um, unfortunately, in Godot 3.2, you have to use a string here, but in Godot 4.0, you'll be able to actually use this as a symbol, so you don't have to, um, you can get good auto-completion on it. You won't have to change your string here if the function name changes. But, so, what we're doing here is the exact same thing as if we had connected it via the editor. So it's like double clicking one of these and then connecting this function here. It's doing the exact same thing just via code. And there's reasons to do it via the editor or via code. Typically anything that's UI based or anything that's just a signal that's always on something, um, it's easier to do it via the editor because it's, it's easier to see those connections in your editor. You can see them that they exist either in the signals tab here or see that it's got a connection symbol on it but sometimes you have to do it via code. When you're instancing things programmatically or accessing something via code, you also need to connect to those signals via code, which is why we're doing it here. But whether it's via code or via the editor, they're both totally valid and will accomplish the same thing. So whenever our scroll bar, scroll, scroll bar excuse me, emits the change signal, this handle scroll bar change function is going to get called. So it's within here that we need to actually implement are scrolling to the bottom. And in order to do that, it's actually pretty easy. We can just say scroll dot scroll vertical. And so this is the, if you look at our scroll container, you'll see the scroll vertical property here. It's called scroll vertical. So this is what we're adjusting. And we're gonna set the scroll vertical to be our scroll bar dot max value. And so what we're doing here is we're saying, hey, scroll container, scroll vertically down to as far as your vertical scroll bar can go. It's a bit convoluted. It's unfortunate that it's not a little bit easier to do this or that we can't do it all within our scroll container. We have to actually access our scroll bar, but it's a small price to pay to have this functionality. 
And so if I run this now, and you'll see that when I tried to type something, we actually got an error again. It's the same one we had before, the can't call a function in null instance. And the reason why is because we changed again, our history rows from scroll container, we changed this to just be scroll and we never updated it. So that was my bad. But now if I change that and run our game again and start typing things, we'll see that once we type enough to get a scroll bar, we're always scrolling to the bottom. So this is really awesome. It's moving us to the bottom and we're always um, there. The problem now is if you try to scroll up, it's actually unable to, it's not letting us. And the reason this is happening is because whenever we try to scroll, we are altering the page property of our scroll bar. And remember that this changed signal gets emitted whenever the minimum, maximum values the step or the page property on our scroll bar are changed. So we only want this function to be called when our max scroll value changes. But unfortunately, the signal's being emitted and this function's being called at other times when we don't want it and it's preventing us from scrolling. So the way we're gonna get around that is to keep track of our max scroll value and only actually let this function do something and bring us to the bottom if our max scroll length has changed. So I'm going to create a new variable called variable max scroll length. And this is just going to be an integer. I'm going to set it to zero for now. It doesn't really matter. And then what we're going to do is we're going to say scroll uh, max scroll length equals scroll bar dot max value. And so now we're setting a baseline for our max scroll length. And then whenever our, we get to this scroll bar change function, we only want to do something if our max, if our new scroll bar max value is different than our previous max scroll length. So I'm going to say if max scroll length does not equal scroll bar dot max value, then there's a couple things we need to do. One is say max scroll length equals scroll bar scroll bar whoops dot max value. So we need to update our max scroll length to meet or to match our new max scroll value. And then it's only within this if statement that we actually wanna to scroll to the bottom. And I'm gonna change this to be max scroll, whoops, length. I missed that, that was supposed to be an M. And so now what's gonna happen is we're only going to scroll down to the bottom when our scroll length changed. And it's important that you actually update our new scroll length here to make sure this works. So now if I run this and I start typing, you'll see that when I type, we're still sticking to the bottom, which is good. But now if I try scrolling, it actually lets us scroll up and move around because our max scroll length is not changing. Therefore, even though that signal is being emitted, we aren't actually doing anything. So this is perfect. And if I type something when we're scrolled up, you'll see that it'll bring me right back to the bottom. So this is exactly what we want. You're able to go back and look at your history, but if you type something new, it'll bring you to the bottom. So this is a perfect medium. We've got something where we can scroll up and see our history, but also where whenever we type something new, it's gonna bring us to the bottom of our scroll history again. So I think this is a good place to stop for now. Thanks so much for watching everyone. Hope this video has been helpful. If it has, a like and subscribe to support the channel are always appreciated. We'd love to have you in our Discord server. Link to that is in the description. Feel free to ask any questions about the tutorial there. And if you find my work helpful, donating a coffee on Buy Me A Coffee, linked also in the description, helps me continue to make great tutorials. Thanks so much for watching everyone. See you in the next video.